panelists uh, picking in their own experience uh, and, and own perceptions will tell you what this journey mean for them in their life, in their professional life as well, and what kind of frustrations or expectations this journey is, is, is raising. We could be pessimistic. We could say, look, there are emissions rising. There is pollution uh, which are going on in a, a, a unprecedented scale. We decided not to be overly pessimistic. Of course, we need to know what's going wrong. But the, the, the outcome we expect is to provide insights on what is actually occurring, which is more positive. And on the basis of these positive tones and positive stories, to demonstrate that we are capable to raise, about, to raise above ourselves and to address the challenges of our time. So we really, really, really rely on the stories that we've been told here by these different people to say, okay, look, this we don't know how to deal with, but there are a few positive signs uh, popping up. It's true there are challenges. There are challenges in this journey because we have to think, we live in, we live, we live a world we've been in for years and years and decades. And we have to think out of the box. Uh, we have to find new tools through parts policy makers, it's true as well in the private sectors and so on. And we have to combat as well some vested interests and old ideas, yet there are opportunities. And there are opportunities to leapfrog uh, thanks to social innovations, technological innovations, and despair the very simplistic ideas according to which development is a linear process. So we will focus on the, on, the, on the opportunities. And the way we'll be proceeding, uh, my suggestion is this way. We will start at the kind of macro level, a global level, and the Chinedum will set the perspective on where we're in, in terms of climate change, the different commitments. You might be well aware about that, but it's good to have a refresh and, and, and an update on all that. And then we try to get a, down at the more micro level, starting with the energy sector and what's going on on sustainable city, which will be done uh, thanks to, to Mohammed. Then we move to an ever more granular uh, piece uh, with, um, um, with stocks in, and, and, and talk about the architecture and what the climate smart building means or doesn't mean in Africa in particular. And then we step aside and we look at the natural resources and the relationship between uh, uh, human and interference between human activity and the natural resources in the very case of a chimp, uh, chimpanzee habitat conservation. This will be the first part. Then we'll have Q&A and exchange on what's going on at these three different levels, macro to micro. And then we'll move to the scaling up. How do we scale up these positive initiatives? And there, we'll have three uh, different perspectives, one from the CSO, thanks to Pius, uh, another one from a foundation, it will be, uh, it will be uh, uh, Amara, and RANT will provide us with a more private sector perspective. And for all these different interventions, uh, it will be basically 10 minutes each. We'll have an insight of what this speaker is doing, why can't he or can't she do because there are hurdles there and what could be the way out in terms of recommendations. And we would like the recommendations to be crafted here to be conveyed further uh, uh, to different fora where we'll be do discussing this topic. And I'm thinking about two fora in particular. One which will prepare the COP26 in Glasgow, which will be convened by NEST, if I'm not wrong, in, in, uh, in, in July, uh, where there will be inputs from this, uh, this uh, afternoon debate. And the second one, which is an uh, uh, Afrique-France uh, uh, summit to be convened in France early July, where, where again we will try to provide some inputs. So I stop there. I thank you very much for um, uh, attending this audience, and I give the floor to Professor <laughs> Chinedo. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues and friends, and thank you, Sankrit, my, who has become my friend and um, partner in many things we've had the opportunity to do recently. Um, five years after the Paris Agreement, looking ahead to Glasgow, are we doing well? The question he asked at the beginning, I looked out to see Nigerian hands raised. I didn't see any. I saw our friend's hands raised. So maybe he started um, very quickly and I asked that question again. Are we doing well? If you think we're doing well, raise your hand. So it's the same. Oh, one? Did you raise your hand, Buari? Very good. So we got one person saying we did well. Um, my task is very well defined, the way he puts it. 
coming from the national level, the macro level, and trying to come downstairs to the smaller units and then on to the point where uh, the, fresh, the fresh voices will be able to let us understand what specific things are happening in the sectors it's named. Well, since the Kyoto Protocols and the Great Meeting in Paris in 2015, and on to the signing ceremonies shortly after in New York, and then our commitment willingly and freely, as every other country that a signatory is required to do, which we call the nationally determined contribution to carbon reduction. What specific things have indeed happened since then? As we know, or as you may remember, we have a commitment to reduce our carbon emission as a country by 25% without any assistance. But we have support, mostly technical and financial support. We'll be able to aspire to get to 40% reduction. That's the commitment. Right now, we are reviewing that. And the COP in Glasgow that he mentioned will be a reporting COP to report what has happened. I quite understand the role of France in this discourse and the sense of responsibility that you bear and that you carry. The Paris Agreement was a landmark agreement. The world's most serious commitment to address the challenge of climate change. We've come a long way in the last decade in Nigeria from a time of ambivalence and a time of doubts and debates about climate change. We've had a number of national documents, national policy on climate change, the national adaptation strategy of action on climate change, the national response documents on climate change, the gender and climate change documents, and quite a number of others. We've had series of meetings, workshops. We've had discourses of all types. What has changed in practice? I look forward to hearing from fresh faces. The youth, the younger people, whether younger by biology or younger by thinking, fresh, as he has mentioned. You have floored the opportunity. It's about the future as the world designs and builds a new global economy that is green and that is low on carbon emission. And also a world that takes up opportunities presented by the climate challenge. There are indeed so many opportunities. Opportunities in energy, new forms of energy, new forms of energy generation and consumption. Opportunities in new generation of cities, designs, and houses. Opportunities in virtually every sector of the economy of Nigeria that could and should generate jobs, employment, income, and address a lot of the social challenges that are hinged on the challenge of poverty, which is a major challenge in Nigeria. So I also like to stop now and give opportunity to the fresh and new voices. Thank you very much. So may I call the panelists to join us, uh, all of you, on, on stage. And um, we'll start with uh, Mohammed on the energy and um, green cities. So you can stand, you can sit, you can dance, you can... <laughs> 
Okay. Um, let me stand up. Uh, I am Muhammad uh, Buhari. I'm representing the Intercampus City Association or for sustainable cities. And I am going to briefly discuss with you our experiences on the project that was sponsored by the French partners, which is on the Iraq adaptation to climate change. Our experiences, the way we we work from my university in Bayre, Bayre University in Kano and the other colleagues down in University of Ibadan and in Lagos and other colleagues in JOS will share with you those experiences. And I believe that we are doing enough for now because before, before last year, 2020, 2021, we did nothing as far as we are concerned. But now we have done something. We have set up an association and we have some projects and we have engaged communities. We have met more than 500 different people on for that project. So and that experience tells us that we have done something. We cannot say we didn't do anything. It was better than, it's better to move than not doing anything. So that experience is what I'll share with us this afternoon and others that I have uh, experience on. And you're free to ask questions. So thank you. you, can, you can stop. Okay. Okay, I'm, I've been given the opportunity to start. So to share my experience on the Intercampus Alliance for Sustainable Cities project. This was a project that was uh, prearranged or arranged, organized by the French Embassy and about seven partner universities were invited and researchers were drawn from different departments. The experience in my own university, in Bayer University, is I was from uh, electrical engineering. My specialization is on integration of renewable energy into the national grid. That's my specialization. There were other researchers called from the, bio the biology department, some from geography department, and one from mechatronics department. And the experience here is, we want to build sustainable cities due to the uh, challenge of the climate. The climate has been changing and the average temperatures have risen, the risk of flood has risen, um, there, are, there is drought up there in the north we have uh, a lot of challenges to do with agricultural production and that has affected our livelihood. In fact, to make things worse, it has already affected our security, as you know already. We have issues to do with uh, uh, Boko Haram, we have issues to do with uh, the Hadas Farmer clashes, and all of these have a lot of, uh, it has direct link with the climate change. So now with the opportunity given to us by the French partners, to set up an association of people who have some level of understanding of the challenge, what can we do practically at the lowest level? So our own association decided to go to the basic, to the grassroots. So we chose to meet, uh, to, to reach out to some estates and to see what can be done for people to adapt to the climate change. How do we now adapt to climate change? So we took the challenge of Lagos State. Lagos, as we all know, suffers from flooding. And the risk of flooding has increased or has risen due to the climate change. And one of the key or root causes of that problem we identified was the dumping, the indiscriminate dumping of refuse in the waterways. So how do we get people to reduce that or to manage that? So we thought, we, we, we got together, we thought carefully and then thought, find out that, okay, what we'll do is, we'll get, we're going to come up with some, with two innovative projects two innovative projects, technology-based projects, things that we have never seen before in our cities. And we want to get people to manage the waste better. So one was, we're going to build a recycling, uh, so a small recycling system. And what, what, what that does is, all the plastic waste from our Coca-Cola drinks, our water drinks, the one we drink from the bottled water, when we collect them, how do we crush them into manageable sizes? So we, we met with Loma, and Loma told us that the challenge is people dump uh, a lot of those plastic waste in the waterways. And those are the root causes of the blockages. And with the increasing risk of flood, it means any times it rains heavily here in Lagos, then the roads will all be flooded. So we now said, OK, we'll meet the estate. We, we're going to pro uh, provide them with something, a, a waste bin compactor. So we have a waste bin compactor. And for the first time, this waste bin compactor has additional components. It is easy for them to collect all the plastic waste, crush them, or compact them into smaller sizes. Loma only comes, the frequency for Loma taking up the refuse bin is one in, once in a day. So now if they come once, it's already bulky. And they cannot take all. They have to leave some behind sometimes. 
So if, what if we are able to compact it for them in an innovative way so that they can now take as much and evacuate as much of those plastic wastes out of uh, the site so that there will be none dumped inside the waterway. So we chose one estate here in Ebutemeta, and the other one, the other area is in Makoko. So the first area was we built this simple waste compactor bin. We also attached a weather display system to it. So they could see the latest weather information, the chances of precipitation, chances of rainfall falling in the next hour. They can see that. And in the light, with just a simple solar panel, they have lighting. It's going to light the place where the compactor is being used. And that helps them to even walk at night or somebody can come and compact the waste in the evening or when, at hours when the, the environment is dark. With that, we went to the LSDPC estate. When you walk into that estate, you keep go straight, you will see our small system there. And the whole uh, people living in that estate, the households, there are more than about more than 50 flats there. So the, 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 the waste uh, bottles that they, they, they pack up there, they will crush them into small, into, they will compact them into small sizes. And when Loma comes, Loma can just pick them and go with the compacted uh, sizes. So that is one of the projects. Now the second one was, OK, one of our colleagues who's to, who is a researcher in uh, physics, electronics, what he did was he now went back to look at the biodigester. I don't know if you have known a biodigester. You pick, you pack your solid waste, you put in the, in, into the biodigester, and I don't want to go too technical, you get to produce some gas. And that gas is similar to the one we use for cooking. So that simple biodigester was also deployed in an area in Makoko with the consent, because we had community orientation. We got the, is it Bali they call him? Sorry, I am not good in the language. Somebody who is the leader of that community. Baleko, yeah. So the man, the guy, the, the Bale came with all respect with uh, his uh, team uh, in the palace. We went to do that uh, Dubali. We greeted them. They come, we showed them how to use that biodigester to produce some gas. At least three to four people can get some small, the smallest cooking uh, gas. So they can get some, they can, they, they connect it to it. They leave it for three, four days, then you have some gas inside. So some people have some free gas. So some people working in the Bali's palace are the ones who use that gas. But at least what we are trying to say here is we are able to demonstrate that we, have, we can adapt to the changing climate. It is possible. And we can do that using simple projects. And that, that we try to demonstrate. And it is possible also, again, the other benefit is to sh also prove to Nigerians that those of us who are doing the research in the university are capable of also trying to be part of the solution, to solve those problems that we have in our communities. So that's, that association that was formed and supported by the French embassy helped us, for me, who live up there in Kanu, it made me to meet with new colleagues down south to do to solve a problem that is of collective interest to us. We also have flooding now due to climate change up there. And we can use a similar approach to solve our problems. So in that context, we'll say, have we done enough? Yeah. We have not done very bad, but we can do better. But at least we have done something. So that is what I'm trying to, to that's where I stand. So this is about the Intercampus inter uh, Association for Sustainable Cities. This is the small project we did. And this project took only for us because the registration of the association came with some um, uh, problems. Between November to February was what we used to deliver on these two projects. And they are, the projects are there in the communities now. If you go, if you walk, you will see them. You will find them. They are there. They are working. You can ask the community members, ask them what they think about it. It has changed the way they see managing waste. It has proven to them that with the climate changing, since it's inevitable that the climate has changed and is changing, then the only way out is for us to adapt to the way to it's changing and then change it slightly, uh, tweak the way we live our lives, and we can always get better. So that is the point. Now, the second experience to share with you is with the support of the French partners as well, we were able, in our university, we have what is called a Fabi Lab or fabrication laboratory. For the first time in our university, we have 3D printers given to us, about three of them, with some other equipment, with Raspberry, with some microcontrollers, and so many other small uh, pieces of gadgets. We want to train some of the few of us who have experiences working with those kind of uh, uh, small devices and instruments. 
do not have something to show to our students and to uh, motivate them to get them to be able to, to do something with it. Now with the with the Fabi Lab now, the queue is yeah, locked. Everybody wants to be in the Fabi Lab, including the lecturers. We're able to show that you can use 3D printers to print so many of your prototypes that you have. And we are already working on that. We are already using it in our university. And it's, it has changed the way we think totally in our university. It has changed the way our students see the engineering discipline. And it has changed the way most people thought that maybe perhaps engineering was on the paper or science was on the paper, it's theory. And there is a big, correct, uh, big gap between the theory and actually achieving something. Now, the final year projects we have this year, for instance, there are students who have been trained. We trained 20 special students on the use of SOLIDWORKS, which is a computer-aided uh, graphic design. They already have designed a small cooling system for us. Kano, we have challenge with the, high, with the temperature. Now, as I left Kano yesterday, the temperature was up to 44 degrees centigrade in the afternoon. And this lasts for about uh, four hours. So it's very hot. We need a lot of cold water. How do we create, sustainably create cold water? Because people use some big generators that emit a lot of uh, CO2 and it's inefficient, but to make it simple. Yes, yeah. Now in the fab lab, those guys, those students who have been trained especially on that, on that solid works are already, have already, together with their lecturer, have already designed a small cold room and we have the prototype. And we are almost, we're going to be using that fab lab to demonstrate. The controllers for, the, for that uh, conditioner will be from some of the microcontrollers donated to us at the fab lab. So there are some things that are happening as far as adaptation to climate change is concerned. That's what I'm trying to say. And a lot is happening, but we are trying, we have learned our lessons. We are going back to the grassroots, to the basics. When we get most, more people interested, more communities interested, then hopefully we are going to be able to meet our targets as Prof has already signed for us. So thank you for the opportunity. If you have questions, please ask. We will end at the end after everyone. Sorry? People can keep the questions. OK. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we move to the, the next speaker, um, uh, which will be dealing with more uh, uh, building level or architecture, are there clarification uh, yeah. questions you would like to raise to, to Mohammed? Oh. I have some, but it will be for the debate later, so. Yeah. Okay. In this case, Tosin, if you're ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Tosi Oshino. I am an architect practicing in Lagos, Nigeria. I run a practice here called CM Design Atelier. We've done some notable projects um, in the country, but I think uh, I think what's important in specific to specifically speak about here today is is the role of the building industry within the subject of climate change and sustainability. And as I was having a conversation with Prof at lunch, we've we are still building with the same materials that we've built since the 1950s in this part of the world, which is predominantly concrete and sandcrete blocks. And um, there, was, there was a movement that happened in the 50s with tropical architecture, which was designing buildings that were conscious of the environment, uh, using cross ventilation, natural light, passive systems to ensure not necessarily a heavy um, requirement of services which we have kind of lost and has to really come back in to, to really push the agenda of uh, reduced amount of energy consumption in, in the building use. As architects, it's our responsibility to ensure that we educate our clients and also provide spaces that are comfortable for people to occupy so that we can make this a reality. But that's one part of it. That, that's really about building occupation. The other sector that we need to consider is building materials and looking at more sustainable materials. Now, what a, when I was in school, when people said vernacular, we understood vernacular to mean traditional. But vernacular doesn't mean traditional. Vernacular actually means local materials, materials in that locality that are used to build form. The reason why we associate them with um, traditional buildings is, obviously, before modernization, people built what was available in that location. So you have villages where they use laterite soil to build block work walls and thatch for roofs because that was the material available. 
Obviously, with modernism, there was the burst of concrete, and it really has changed the world. And really, all that we see in our cities today are really buildings that are based on modernism. How can we take our understanding of the vernacular and bring it back into the building so we can build buildings that the materials are appropriate, they are conducive for the environment, in our case, to keep cool during the day and warm at night, but also start to look at it in a modern day context. And this is a very early, this early conversation. There are people in the industry who are beginning to look into it, but it's, it's really in its infancy because again, as architects, we are producing buildings based on people's use. And people pay for these buildings. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a push and a pull. But also something to note that's really important is the fact that over 50% of us live in cities today. This is not changing anytime soon. We are burning our finite resources to sustain our living conditions. Over 70% or close to 70% in 2050 will live in cities. And we need to make very conscious decisions as individuals living in cities in terms of how we occupy our spaces, um, the materials that are used to occupy our spaces, but also designed to ensure that we do leave something behind for those coming after us. And that's what I want to share. Thank you. Before we move to the natural resources, because it's a, a consistent pack in a way, I, I had two questions for you. Uh, one first, Mohammed, on the, on, on the financing. Uh, I know we, it's one of the drivers of the change. So you mentioned you get some funding from uh, funder ABC. I was wondering whether you could have tapped local finance uh, easily or not. I mean, are there, are there domestic sources for financing the kind of project you mentioned? Uh, is, was it a constraint uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in the design of the project and the, the implementation of the project or not? And how do you see the financing ecosystem for the kind of green innovation and waste management you mentioned in, in, uh, in, uh, in Nigeria and the place you're, you're operating? And, and Tosin, on the part of um, the, the own initiative from, from architects to, to design a green, let's call it green or climate smart building, and the share of regulation which is coming up years after year, how do you see the, uh, wh where do you see the need to, to, to strengthen, um, to strengthen the, either the regulation or the, the, the awareness among architects? Because I, I, I'm sure there are plenty of architects who are well aware of climate change, but m others might not. And so do we need a Pritzk, Pritzker, is it the right name? Pritzker Prize for a climate change building? Do we need more regulations, or do you see the, 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 the balance between these two regulation versus own initiative? So it would be my question before moving further with natural resources. Chine, you may have some as well. But, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, earlier, on at the, earlier on in the day and um, at lunch, well, we had some discussions by the side. Uh, in your own case, Mohammed, uh, what, you present, what you presented mostly is um, the the RS project yes. supported by the French Embassy involving seven universities in Nigeria. Very unique and creative thing in my assessment. And uh, something I, I can't find another example. An attempt to get people in different disciplines and in different universities to work together collectively, which is why you, based in Kano, will be working in the Butemeta and the Makoko with uh, colleagues from other universities and in other disciplines, something very creative. Um, and you've been able to show that the work you have done makes sense. We appreciate that. Now, um, what happens going further? Uh, we, we, we cannot only have things like this by government supporting, foreign government supporting a country like Nigeria. Uh, is there a possibility of being able to market and sell this to the relevant agencies and relevant governments that can upscale, take up these lessons, and in fact, begin to multiply that across our uh, cities? And that then takes me to what Tosin said. Uh, you are a practitioner, you are an architect, uh, drawing houses, and uh, it's good you're sufficiently conscious of it. Um, houses that um, seem to have been influenced by the boom periods of the 70s and the 80s, using materials, like you said, that are not uh, um, uh, materials locally. 
And then you also, then, like you said, you know, you look back to the 60s and 70s, and you seem to find evidences of some attempts at designs and buildings that seem to speak to today better than the houses of the 70s and 80s. And yet, in, in this time, it also looks like you are cut off from this entire discussion as you discuss and you discuss, uh, as you build and as you design. But then, uh, isn't it something that's um, at the level of governance? And that's uh, my contribution earlier today, that when it comes to giving approvals for buildings, it's not a federal matter where much of the activity with respect to climate change has happened in Nigeria. The states and the approving authority, people who approve city designs, people who approve housing designs, shouldn't there be a way that these lessons can become things that can be implemented? And in your work, uh, Mohammed, and also in what you do, uh, Tosin, and these relevant issues, if we are to practically, practically begin to live based on the lessons that we have learned. Is there a gap there? And is it some kind of thing that we should focus on going forward? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who we'll starts first? You? Yeah, go ahead. Let's start with um, the, Both very valid points. I think, um, particularly, I, I think uh, the questions I raised towards me are really to be dealt with at two scales. There's the macro and there's the micro. I think, ultimately, for the, the, the macro, we're looking at the scale of, of policy. We need policy. A lot of the decisions that can ensure that we design buildings more appropriate for the environment are very cost sensitive. And if people have a choice, they will always go in the other direction. Policy must change. When Fashola was in government, he pushed in Lagos State for sewage treatment plants as opposed to soccer ways. And that's the only way, till today, people will do the right thing. You will notice that in areas of Lagos where planning is not really very well enforced, people will still dig a hole in the ground. But that had to be done by government because it is significantly more expensive. And it's not good for the environment. So yes, policy has to be put in place. Policies must be put in place to ensure that people will design buildings appropriate. Because this now goes beyond, because where you have market forces, you do need you know, that countenance of, of, of governments, which is for the greater good of us all, to ensure that we, we push things forward. Then looking at the scale of, 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 of the human, looking at the scale of people in spaces. Yes, I do think that, I think architects also do need to do some reskilling, because there's a generation of practitioners who haven't taken these principles into account. And there's a very, there's a very small difference between putting two windows on one wall and putting one on either side. There are principles of design, but the occupation of the space is very different. You know, and it's important to ensure that people, that the, the practitioners, whether the client asks for it or not, you need to be able to educate your client and say, this is the reason why. It's not just because it looks nice. There's actually an alternative function, which is to ensure that we reduce the amount of cooling required in this building, which ultimately is good for you in terms of reducing your cost, but also better for the environment. We have a project that we're currently doing at the moment um, for UNDP in Medjugorje, where they are rehousing people displaced from Boko Haram. And they have had two schemes that they've done where they built housing very quickly to, to house the people, but they notice that people don't stay. People would rather go, there, there many reasons, there's not enough shading, uh, the rooms are hot, you know, they don't take into consideration their culture by providing public and private spaces, the Zahuri building, where a male visitor does not see the inside of the compound and the wives. And by sitting with the community, we were able to work out exactly what would work for them, you know. But also, the reality is we're not building in their local material, we're building in, 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 in block work. And so also making sure that we're putting in cross ventilation to make sure that it's comfortable. It's not enough to design a building to look like a vernacular hut that had no windows and do it in concrete and have no windows. We're not providing what's appropriate. So, you know, like I said, two scales, policy, but also for practitioners to understand who they're designing for and, and designing buildings that will be hopefully more sustainable. 
Thank you for, I think I've learned some few things from what she just said as far as uh, sustainable building is concerned. But let me go straight to my own questions. I mean, uh, you were asking about the financing options and Prof was asking something that is connected to it because he's asking us about the sustainability. How do we sustain such kind of proje uh, projects or initiatives? Now, to begin with the financing options, uh, the audience could recall that the way it happens in science and engineering is, first, you need to design a prototype, which is exceedingly more expensive than doing commercial quantities of a certain product. Normal, normally, it, it costs more to come up with an idea and develop it into a prototype. It costs less for it to be produced a mass or mass scale. Now, what, the, what our French uh, friends or partners have done to us is, or what they have enabled us as a country is, they have footed the bills for the most expensive part of it, which is coming up with the prototype and uh, deploying it and now learning, taking feedback from it. Now that we have these two projects, for instance, now already in the communities, a lot of information regarding the performance of the systems can be collated. And now when we are producing the next set of them, it will be far less, it will be far cheaper to produce. That's one hope we have for it. Now, can we get, can we source from, can we get other people to buy in and uh, trust us to say, we want to invest in this? Or can we also get the government to say, okay now, since this has been deployed in an estate, for instance, it means that all estates in Nigeria should consider having solar compactors or having some innovative compacting system to manage their waste responsibly before they even hand it over to the LOMA or to the government agency responsible for evacuating waste. You see, this is already, this project can be, a case can be made using this project. And that is also another way to get uh, other uh, people with financing interests to say buy in because this already has been demonstrated. There is something on ground, there is something to see, there is feedback that can be collected from people who are using these systems, and then there is a way to improve it, and there is a way for investors to now trust that, yes, if we invest to produce more of this, it is it's a viable venture. It's going, to be, be, it's going to bring something back to their pockets. So now by, by overcoming that first barrier of, because if I now meet an investor and tell him, okay, I have an idea in my laboratory, I'm going to build for you a solar compactor and deploy it somewhere, he might be hesitant, compared to when he can see one already working. And already people have feedback given to him that oh, we think this thing is good, it only needs to, this A, B, C can be done and we are happy with it. Another, another investor can take over. So there is a huge potential for commercialization, by the way. So that is, that is one way. So when you have that and anybody, almost anybody can buy in, especially now that people have more money, but the, the ideas are more expensive than the money nowadays. There is money everywhere, but you need to have excellent ideas or proven ideas. Nobody wants to take the risk of trying uh, things that you don't know. So already our French friends have already done that to us. They have already given us the capacity to do that. So I think that is what I can say about the financial options. Now, sustainability going forward as far as that can be seen in two ways. Uh, Prof, I don't know if you are referring to this one that we have deployed. How do we keep it up for the foreseeable future? Or how do we, we as a group, I, as the association of that universities, how do we continue to work? Together, which one is the question? How, how do okay, okay. In which cities are designed and people begin to leave? So excellent question. Now this is a very good question. Now the way to do, I think the way to do that will be okay. Now that we have this demonstration project, it's all about getting to showcase this project or to share the experiences of this project with our decision makers, our policy makers. NUC, for instance, Nigeria University Commissions, all our universities, we can share with our colleagues uh, in terms of seminar, which we try to do. We get them to say, okay, guys, look at, look at what we have done uh, somewhere, and look, this is the impact it has on the community, on the society. We, that seems to be a motivation for our students and for our colleagues. Then we take it up to our policy or decision makers in the states and at the federal level to tell them that it is possible to do projects simpler ones that are homogeneous or that are going to be in sync with our communities. That is the way to go. It's about selling the idea now to others in using various platforms to showcase what had already been done. Because it is always more convincing when you have something to show than when you have something to tell. So that is what I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Now we'll move, if you agree, to the out of the city, to the forest and the, and the bush, uh, calling Rachel uh, to talk about her work on conservation of chimp uh, habitat and the relationship with climate change, and to what extent is her job is easy or not, and I know the answer. <laughs> but it's good to, for you to repeat it. Thank you, everyone. So my name is Rachel Ashikbofe. I am the director of um, an organization called Southwest Niger Delta Forest Project. Um, actually, that's like the name we are known with um, by, um, from amongst the people we work with. But our formal, our legal name as an organization is Foundation for Sustainability for Ecosystem, Wildlife, and Climate. Um, so. Um, we are fighting climate change in a whole new level, a whole different level. And it's not new, it's different. And I, I can assume that a lot of an average Nigerians would know what climate change it is, but they probably would not know what conservation is. Um, so I'm a conservationist um, by profession, or you could call me that. But basically, um, what I would do right now is just um, tell you sort of like a background of our work to what we are doing now and then tell you how that's connected to climate change. Um, it started off with gathering the data where we started off in doing research of, of forest animals and we targeted two primates, um, one endemic to Nigeria, which is the Niger Delta red colobus monkey. Endemic means it's found nowhere else in the world but in Nigeria. And then we started to research also the, um, and the genetic linkage also of um, chimpanzees in southwestern Nigeria, which were also, or which are possibly also endemic to Nigeria. That's special, that's good. But the situation with that is um, when a species is endemic to a particular locality, um, it presents a different kind of, kind of challenge because um, if that species should go extinct in that place, you won't find it anywhere else in the world. And that is a big problem um, generally for the world because right now as we speak, um, 1.6 million species have been discovered by scientists, although we believe there are up to 10 million species of plants and animals out there. But right now, 10,000 species get extinct every single year. And that's a serious problem. And 80% of wildlife and plant species occur in forests. So you see why, why is this all important? They play a very vital role in the ecosystem. And when I get to where climate change, where we're talking about climate change, probably I will dig deeper into how this all plays out into why we are doing what we are doing today. So basically, we founded or established this organization on these um, situation, the realities on ground. There are some species that need to be conserved, and they are in the forest in Nigeria, where deforestation is taking place at a rate that is unprecedented, like in nowhere else. At, at there was a year, According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, Nigeria had the highest deforestation 2005, yes. Um, Nigeria had the highest deforestation rate in the world. And to this day, Nigeria has lost most of its primary forests. And we are talking about 97%, if not more. So many of these forests are as good as gone. We can never get them back. They have been converted to other land use, whether it's agriculture, housing, or whatever. But they are no longer forests. While the remaining 3% that is out there is severely degraded and also going that route. And um, of course, that presents a huge danger, not just for the animals that inhabit these places, but for us as people, because I'm going to come back to that. That's where climate change comes in again. Um, so that's where we came in to provide the conservation intervention for this forest. Um, so we needed to use the data we have collected on both the species and of the forest to, um, shall I say, push for conservation solutions. 
um, both with the government and with the communities that live within and adjacent to these forest areas. So we kind of do a lot of stakeholder engagement with communities and governments. We um, advocate um, for both for the policies. I mean, at the community level, we, we also advocate for the communities themselves to establish some of their local laws that they used to have before to conserve this forest. So it is in the process of time, our organization is almost 10 years old. So this journey didn't start yesterday and it has not been an easy one. But through, during the course of, uh, course the course of time, um, we have been able to establish two protected areas. One for the Cameroon the, um, chimpanzee population in southwestern Nigeria, and the other for the Niger Delta red colobus monkey in the Niger Delta. And why this is important is because preserving forests is, a, is very, very critical as a conservation strategy for these species of animals. And um, thanks to funding from the French Embassy um, in Nigeria and to some of our other donors, all across the world, as in some of them are in the US, in um, other parts of Europe, and we are able to manage these forest areas. They are not big, but they are not as big as we would want, but they are creating the kind of movement that we want. And I'll get to that later when we start discussing local context and grassroots based solutions. Um, so why is this important to climate change? Very simple. Um, the carbon emissions that we emit, um, there, will be, there are other speakers talking about how we can get these emissions out of the atmosphere and all of that. But it is well known fact that, first of all, um, climate change, one of 20% of climate change is caused by deforestation. That's a huge chunk. That means you cut down trees, 20% of climate change is caused by cutting down trees, by deforesting areas. So how do you um, address climate change? Same way, protect forests, protect the trees from being cut down. But not just that, it's not, it's not just that alone, it's, just, it's not that one thing. It's very multifaceted and this is where it gets very important. We all know that um, plants absorb carbon, why? they emit oxygen. We take in oxygen and we emit carbon. So if you want to solve climate change or address climate change, of course, is to get more trees up, absorbing all of those carbon out of the atmosphere. Okay? And um, it's been interesting over the last couple of years. A lot of people have jumped in the, in the, in, 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 in the movement of um, trying to address climate change by tree planting, which is good, it's novel, it's great. Um, we like to say that it's sensational, right? And it's trending. But um, data has, be, is, has started to emerge that it is in protecting intact forests and in allowing forests to regenerate that we are able to sequester more carbon from the atmosphere. And this is very important because we can't cut down the trees and now say we want to now start replanting them. It doesn't work like that for natural species like chimpanzee or Niger Delta Red Colobus or any animals you have right there. This is where that word ecosystem comes in. There is a web of life going on in the, in, in the forest. If you cut down all the trees, all the animals are gone. Even if you start to replant them back, you can't bring the animals out of extinction. There is no vaccine, no cure for species extinction. It doesn't work in that sense. So the forests are very important to the animals, but guess what? The animals, um, the, the animals are much more important for the forest. Take for example, there are seeds of certain tree species that are being um, sown by um, chimpanzees. Chimpanzees will consume certain seeds because they live on leaves and seeds. They will consume certain seeds. Then when they defecate in the forest, on the forest floor, these same seeds germinate when the rain falls in the, on the forest floor and they grow naturally. 
and which is the best way, and this is the most cost-effective, most powerful, most efficient way we can sequester the carbon that is being emitted by the growing human population. And um, I would just like to round off, sorry, I would just like to round off by saying that um, it became important during the course of um, carrying out our own job that we started learning because has been, I always tell everybody, sometimes people call me for meetings and call me an expert and I'm like, wait, look, um, we are very much in a, very, in a learning process. And one of the things I've learned over the last couple of years is that there is no one size fits all. There is no solution, uniform solution for everything. One of the things we are discovering, and thank God we are working in two different parts of the country, and we can tell you for a fact that every solution we have to be tailored to the local context where you are working. So in two, two different areas, yeah. one of the um, things we are, we are trying to do is to bring a, a, a very, very much more inclusive and grassroots um, driven um, not just um, providing solutions, but also in planning, in implementing, and in particip participating in the process of protecting this forest and um, in managing the forest. So finally, basically what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, I think I should just tell you because I think I'll be talking um, in a way that makes me look fancy. So it's very, very, very basic work we're doing. We go to the bush. We walk around the forest, we study the animals, we protect the forest from people who are encroachers. Say, for example, in the southwest, um, the menace in the southwest is marijuana planters. Um, and I don't know if you know much about marijuana planting and all that. They will need to clear out the forest, like get it cleared, every tree goes, so that they can plant the marijuana. So. It's huge in terms of the level of devastation it causes to the forest and forest loss. So we protect the forest from these people who encroach into the protected area. And we, we also continue monitoring of all the species inside the forest. We engage the stakeholders, which are the government and the communities. And by the way, 97% of our staff um, it's made up of people from the communities, whether in the, southwest, um, the southwestern part of, the, of our work or in the Niger Delta. Most of the people who work with us are from the communities. And then we engage the government in designing, formulating policies and establishing the kind of framework that would allow the management of those protected areas to thrive. So our work is really multidisciplinary and it's multifaceted. So we have people with legal background working with us. We have people in policy um, making working with us. We have core science, people biologically oriented working with us. And we also have people who are social scientists who, who work with us. So it's really multifaceted and multidisciplinary approach we are, we are using to, to do our work. Um, unless there is any further question. No question Thank you here, very much. So, <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can think about questions and ask them while I'm, uh, I'm calling the three last um, panelists and we have, a, we, have a, we have a guest at the very end, but I'm calling Pius, Renti and uh, Amara to join because we'll not be talking about the scaling up on the basis of what's been said already. But while um, um, Payos, Renti, and uh, Amara are joining us, if you have questions to Rachel or comments, yes, uh, I will give you a mic. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Essie. I'm from the NESG, Nigerian Economic Summit Group. I was, um, so Rachel, concerning the forestation and deforestation, my question is, you know, um, given the situation with COVID, we're looking for more biodiverse ways to create more drugs, right? And for us, we say we have those drugs in said forest, right? So how do you sort of make that? balance of okay we these 
this forest has drugs that we can actually utilize. But at the same time, we don't really want to cut down trees because of deforestation. So how do you respond to that kind of situation of balancing it with our needs versus what the world needs or what the earth needs? Thanks. If you don't mind, I will take another question and you'll re respond in a row. Good afternoon. My name is Dolapo and I work for Lagos State. I'm the general manager of Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency. Now, where do we strike the balance? You had said there's no one size fits all. I came here late because I was making a presentation on ferrous and non-ferrous metal, circular economy, linear mining and urban mining. We are moving towards digitalization every day in fighting climate change. There are certain metals that we need. You can imagine by the time we move to electrical cars, the demand on lithium. In producing lithium, there are so many GHGs emitted. Now I come back to you. We're talking urbanization and um, growth. For example, Lekki Free Trade Zone, or somebody has a, wants to create a Silicon Valley of Lagos. We would have to cut trees. And how do you balance that with conservation? Similar to her question, thank you. All right, I will answer the first question uh, because in, in a way they sound similar, but they are quite different questions. I will answer the first question. I think it's a very brilliant question. Otherwise, um, um, number one thing is that you, if you, it's for the very reason that we get our medicines, the, the forest is important, not just for vaccines or creating medicines in the pharmaceuticals, but for generations, it's been important for the local people, the people who live within and adjacent this forest. They assess this forest, one, for their medicines, for their food. The forest provides ecosystem services that are important for these people, and it's estimated that there are 350 million people today in the world who live within an adjacent forest. So imagine that many people who depend solely on the forest. It's not like you and I who live in the urban sec section. So these people are at the forefront. They, they are the first people who are the receiving end of climate change, who are the receiving end of biodiversity loss because their whole life is there. It's unlike you and I who go to the market, get our food stuff and all that. So let's remember that. So getting medicines for the forest has nothing to do with deforestation. And it's the very reason why conservation is even of utmost importance because when the forest is gone, we can't have access to the ecosystem services that the forest provides for the people. So the medicine has nothing to do with deforestation. They will take out of the forest, but they are not going to clear down hectares of forest land to put in something there. You understand, something else. You, that's different. So you can assess the forest, get these things out. In fact, even in our own organization, we are already developing programs such as ecotourism within our forest. Students are coming in. As I'm speaking to you, as of this week, some students are applying to want to come into the forest to do one work or the other, just to do their IT or their master's program or whatever. It's, that's how important. We have not been protecting the forest for up to three months yet. I don't know if you get it. Yes, we've, we've got the approval ever since last year, but COVID and all of the things and getting the legal papers together, we didn't start real protection until three months ago, thereabout. So imagine in that short time how important the forest has been for promoting educational opportunities, both for young people and for increasing employment opportunities and access for people within the communities to go in there and, um, and get substance subsistence, we call it subsistence, way of living, for their subsistence way of living to continue. Now to the question of vast development and bigger development occurring. It's been a conflict for years. 
as to how do we balance it? How do we protect forests, protect wildlife, while at the same time there are corporations, there are some levels of development that needs to take place for the human system to function. That conflict will always remain, I'm sorry to say. And I don't think that um, injuring people from deforesting one area has anything to do with injuring development. They are mutually exclusive in my, in my books and from my own understanding of what we have seen. I've been to several parts of the world like Kenya, Tanzania and different parts of the country where this, continues, this kind of conflicts continue to arise. Take for example, um, they call avocado the green gold nowadays and they are trying to grow avocado pear plantation in a place that's even not a conservation area by the side of the Ambosali landscape in Kenya. And some conservationists came up and said, no, you can't do that. Is it because they don't want the, the people to have those kind of plantations and reap from it? No. It's just because the equation is not balanced. It doesn't work out well. That's why we have EIA. I've done a lot of consulting jobs like that, EIA. We understand these things. We have to look at the math. Is this going to pay us in the end? When you have your free trade zone and you create that, does this pay us in the long term compared to when you conserve this forest? You have to do the maths. You have to weigh it. And that's why it's very important. At this stage where we are, we've lost so much that even to gain back is quite difficult. And we're on the road. But this is where we need to have that understanding that it's much better that we do the right thing now than do the wrong thing and pay for it later. Thank you. Right. I, I just want to contribute to that. Um, talking about development, we really do need to change our mindset to our urban cities and our urban sprawl. We need to think up. But we have a lot of buildings in Nigeria today that are abandoned. You know, we have, we look at these buildings and it's easier or cheaper to build a new building instead of repurpose the building that's gone. Federal Palace, sorry, Federal Secretariat has been there for years. Why is it still empty? You know, we're, 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 we're moving further and further out, building poorer and poorer quality buildings. When we have buildings that at the times were, were, were built to such a grade A standard and are not functioning. We look at Lagos Island, Marina. So many of those buildings are empty. We have no business increasing urban sprawl when we have spaces that we can reappropriate and, and, and solve some of the very crucial accommodation issues we have in the city today. Okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm Sunday Gato. I write for this Denis Uh My question is to Rachel, and um, it's um, uh, related to conservation of our wildlife. Of course, some of us are uh, aware of the news last week that an elephant was also killed in um, the fort in two years, right? Um, it keeps occurring. It seems no one is doing anything. How do we step in? You know, uh, like you said, some of these locals live their livelihood. Their livelihood is from the forest. So the set of people that kill the elephant, they are hunters. They make money ends meat from killing wildlife squirrels antelopes as much as you can think of so still coming back to how to strike the balance by saying you are conserving this species are you not in one way denying these people of their means of livelihood now even if you are not or rather assuming they, are, they consent to that how do, they, how do we then create a replacement? What do they do if they should stop hunting? Of which they will tell you, these they are, you know, they've been doing it for years. This, from their fathers to their fathers and all of that. So, is there a way we can balance this? How do we stop them from killing the wildlife while they are also feeding? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me much give an advice, please, Rachel, if you don't mind. Um, I really suggest that we, we, you take note of the question. Um, the, the top official from the government was not here when the first two presented, and they said things that would have been very interesting to you. 
I like us to take this in a holistic manner, recognizing the linkages between each of them and also focusing on the main theme of the day. And I advise that each of the other three very quickly also makes their presentations considering the time. Then we shall take our questions and further interventions in the context of the holistic within of all this and, and uh, please 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 do agree with me that we do that so um we we move on to um um uh, rachel you keep a question and there are some others and in fact i also have my own questions as well as my own comments to the top official from the government using my using the opportunity the privilege being somebody who headed the team that did the lagos adaptation strategy in 2010-12. I'm trying to find the copy. I hope you still have a copy. But so let's go to... Um, uh, okay, Pius then. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and also thank you for having us now because I believe um, we are now the community people speaking. So we are speaking from the community now, having have um, the experts spoke up uh, in these issues. Um, I'm Pius Oku. I work for Climate and Sustainable Development Network. Uh, it's a coalition of civil society organizations and CBOs uh, made up from the different facets in the faith-based organizations, community-based youth women groups, and um, we work on climate change, actually, as an advocacy group and also policy influencers. Uh, I'm a sustainable development practitioner and also a climate change or climate justice practitioner campaigner. Um, let me speak quickly on um, my own experience um, coming from the CSO uh, background. Um, of course, the Paris Agreement came into being, of course, like um, Prof rightly said, in 2015. And um, we, from the grassroots, of course, know that um, there's need for collective or multi-stakeholder approach towards implementing of um, the Paris Agreement. And first of it is understanding and ownership. And so with that, uh, we started with the 2015 action or action 2015 campaign, of course, which cut across cities and countries in trying to bring an understanding of what really the new agreement is for, uh, or as a commitment is for countries, communities, and cities as well, for us all to key into. And of course, that of course was successful. And going uh, with that, we know that um, also working with the grassroots, which is also the, because we know that definitely climate change is worsening poverty as it regards, or as it regards social, economic, and environmental development. And so the grassroots is the most vulnerable. And with that, we need to also take it to the grassroots. So uh, we came up with a project called Deepening Civil Society Engagement in Post Paris Agreement Dialogue and response strategies. And um, that's, of course, with um, the support of the Swedish government. One of the tasks was to uh, come up with evidence-based policy influence. And that is through development, production, dissemination of information jointly with research institutions uh, into, for example, the Nigeria nationally determined contribution, looking at the priority areas. Of course, we had five priority areas, which we now take into account on how we could influence policies around this area. And first of it is, we had to let or bring an understanding between the policies, what is on ground and what is on practice. And so we came into a development of research, joint research with national institutions. And for us not to be biased as well, we need also the scientific point of view, and that's why we had to also engage uh, the scientists or in research institutions. And with that, we successfully uh, did some research, one on looking at, for example, the key area, of which is oil and gas, for example, in Nigeria, because we know a major chunk of economy comes from that angle. 
And so we look at the practice or compliance practice of Nigeria in the oil and gas sector as regards to reducing emission, uh, emission target, of course, which is part of uh, the Nigerian own plan. Uh, furthermore, we also engage in, because we know that energy is also a major issue uh, in Nigeria. And so looking at energy access, availability and, ass um, and efficiency, uh, of course, we had to go into uh, research looking at the energy uh, or renewable energy in Nigeria. And um, a lot of them also come with uh, some recommendation, of course, relatively uh, with the government. Of course, other issues, of course, like uh, the COVID-19, uh, for example, we did a research, of course, on the impact of the COVID-19 on NDC implementation in Nigeria and across African countries. Of course, with a lot of institutions and also the University of Glasgow uh, with, with that. Another thing, of course, which we also take into cognizance and which we are also working with is empowering and engendering civil society organizations to hold government, of course, accountable in the commitments. And part of it is we also engage in a dialogue format. And part of it is organizing a pre and post COP, which is an annual engagement that we have with ECOWAS, of course, which is the regional block, and also uh, the Nigerian Ministry of uh, Environment and multi stakeholders from across uh, the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. And what we do is we try to come together with stakeholders to see where Nigeria priority areas are and also advise government in terms of common position, which of course is also taken to uh, the, or given to the government or as a way of helping to also see how we could also influence Nigeria position going into negotiations, of course, in the COP. And then coming back, we have what we call the post-COP, where we also analyze uh, the outcomes and also bring understanding so that it could translate back to the grassroots. And so that's also part of what we also have been trying to do. Other aspect, of course, is the importance of youth. We know that definitely our youth are the engineering power to driving the NDC implementation in Nigeria. And so how can we do this? Is to bring them together. Because youth, of course, with amazing ideas glowing around the country, but the issues of capacity, sometimes also funding, which also is a major challenge. And how can we do this, especially in terms of uh, engaging with policymakers? So we have uh, like an acronym which uh, Prof was asking the question and asked what has changed. So we came up with what we call what has changed as a format to engaging policymakers. So we have what we call the youth digital activist, and that also helped uh, very well during this COVID era where we're not able to have physical presence or physical activities ongoing. So we came up with this to make sure that we have youth digital acti activists known as the YDAs and community resource persons uh, which are in the communities. And what do we do? We look at some of the commitment, of course, that has data on ground. What can we change from them or what has changed since those commitments? And how can we do that differently? That's another approach, of course, electronically, because we know the era that we are, I mean, that we are in. Other issues, of course, we know the importance, just like uh, Richard was mentioning, the issues of uh, the forest. And so through the World Bank funding, we also engage in uh, strengthening CSOs and CBOs, that's community-based organizations, in understanding uh, the red plus and or coming into the red plus and climate change processes in Nigeria. And looking at that, we know the difficulty, of course, of saying people shouldn't cut trees. And how can we do this better? Is by going to the community, create an ownership within the community, and also give a kind of alternative livelihood options or training for the communities. And of course, this has been done with communities across uh, the, the countries, I mean, uh, across the states, in Ondo, for example, which is a Red Plus state, in Crossover State, which is holding, of course, the uh, major part of the Nigeria primary forest, over 50%, still being held there, but a lot of deforestation ongoing at that level. So what can we do is to make sure that we train the communities, forest-dependent communities, on alternative livelihood options that are not forest 
dependent or that will not lead to cutting down of trees. Of course, there are a lot of advantages or a lot of uh, practice areas within the forest in which they could also use in achieving some of their livelihood issues, which is driving them into deforestation and, of course, leading to issues of climate change. And, of course, we have issues like um, the honeybee keeping uh, other aspects like the bush mango harvesting and also trading value chain in terms of agriculture for some of the agricultural practices which are sustainable. And also encouraging partnership in the area of smart agricultural production. And that is what also we have been doing. In the other aspect, of course, wash water is also another key area which uh, presently in the reviewed NDC, ongoing review NDC is part of now the NDC because we had that, or we, we had the NDC before uh, with five sectoral action plan, excluding water. And Nigeria is largely covered by water. So water is essential for livelihood. And so we also went into engagement in what we call including or transiting the, the I mean, water or wash into the Nigeria NDC. And lucky for us, of course, we have it as part of the Nigeria NDC as we speak, which will be, uh, that's the revised NDC, which will be uh, uh, submitted to the UNFCCC. And of course, other aspects, which include also Youth Roundtable. Together with the Federal Minister of Environment, we've also channeled a process of where we could have youth share some of the amazing ideas that they have, and also see how funding opportunities will come into play and helping the youth transit into having those fantastic ideas into opportunities that create jobs and also alleviate the issues of suffering and also livelihood issues being tackled. And that, of course, has been amazing with also the support of uh, the European Union and the UNDP. And with that already, uh, there's progress being made. Out because of the COVID-19, um, there's a lot of delay or kind of delay in that aspect. But, of course, it is also ongoing and it's, it's, it's fine. So, I'd like to say that um, for us, we also know that climate change is very important, but as climate change is important, we are also important. <laughs> and we should know that climate okay. change also comes with responsibility that also affects humans. And for Nigeria, a country like Nigeria, our area or our huge resource to tap in is our nature-based or nature-based solutions or our natural resources. And if we can now have the right support in terms of multi-stakeholders approach, using stakeholders as think tank rather than having consultancies in areas where we have already have the capacity, then we'll be able to tackle the issue of climate change. And that's where we are coming in to make sure that we have multi-stakeholders approach in trying to also see how we could tackle this. And with that also, we also are also proud to say that we have now a coalition where we, say, we call it the Nigeria Civil Society Framework for Paris Agreement and the SDG. And that coalition is made up of different thematic groups and expertise and consultants is helping to see how we could shape in action in driving the implementation of the Paris Agreement in tackling climate change. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. You. Thank you very much. We have an illustration of how to connect the macro and the micro and, um, and uh, grease the wheel so, so that the world system might change and take the shift uh, required. If you agree, we will move on. We, we have information according to which uh, we could close at the latest 4.30, right, Leila? Which means that we should prepare to end at around uh, 20 past 4 to us to wrap up a little bit. And then we move to a cocktail for the one we can attend and we can further discuss in a bilateral mode. So we move now to another driver of change from the perspective of scaling up all the initiatives mentioned here and the others existing. Um, uh, around climate change and climate action. Talking, with, uh, talking about capital first, we talk about the, the natural capital, then we have, we'll, we'll have a, a presentation on natural and uh, financial capital, uh, thanks to Renty. Um, and then with Amara, we try to liaise with the first introduction of, uh, of um, uh, Chinedum on the, what means all these talks at the COP level for uh, countries like Nigeria. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. 
So my name is Ratiola Akiola from Natural Eco Capital. So I'm speaking on behalf of the private sector. That's the angle I'm coming from. So Natural Capital is an environmental sustainability consulting firm. And then we work on the concerns of climate change. And then we work uh, closely with the private sector and of course the government. So we have a series of projects that we are working on uh, to answer the big question of the day that are we really doing enough? Yes, we are not, um, we might not be doing enough, but activities have been ongoing. So I'm gonna be sharing just two of our projects with you that uh, we are doing in um, speaking about the private sector. So we have this project funded by the African Development Bank to scale up climate action for the SMEs. And then this um, focus on um, six countries, which Nigeria is one of them. And then the idea is to develop um, climate screening tools to see how you can support these um, SMEs in making them access climate funds. Yeah, climate finances, because we know that um, you know, in making right action, funds are needed. But how do they really, really assess this fund if they are not well placed? Like if their operations are not green enough. So that is what those um, tools are going to be used for. And then a lot has been going on because um, we have been test running and then we have been engaging a lot of SMEs in Nigeria and then the other pilot countries. Well, maybe at the cost of um, answering questions, I'll be explaining more. Then the second one I want to share is the LTV, Long-Term Emission Strategy Plan in Nigeria. And then we are doing this in support, um, in support from 2050 pathway. From 2050 pathway, and then the this is the Department of Climate Change of the Federal Ministry of Environment has been working closely with us. Now, the focus and the aim of this project is to design and develop the emission target that the country wishes to meet before the year 2050. So we have the five sectorial uh, focus for NDC, and we want to see, okay, what are the amount of emission that you are looking up and you know so sure that you are going to be hitting by the year 2050. So that is um, the project, that is what is focused on. But because of our time, I don't want to spend much time, but I know that in answering questions, I will be explaining more about them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have questions, but I keep for the discussion. Amara, would you mind, would you mind telling us what we started to discuss about during lunchtime? I mean, the, the, the fact that we have this, um, the big gorillas in the COP uh, conversation, and uh, uh, part of the commitment takes the form of the NDC's nationally determined contribution, and the D of determined might be contested in some particular countries because we know that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it has been written in some cases by experts who do not know about the country. So this is a kind of illustration of the possible mismatch between the call for action, which is ratified by many countries, and the, the delay we are talking on. So it's not only a matter of wording and legal basis, but the very, the very definition and substantive part of it might be um, uh, out of reach for many uh, stakeholders. So the floor is yours, Amara. <laughs> Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Uh, my name is Amara uh, Wampa from the Yarador Foundation. Um, so the first thing I'm going to ask before I, because I'm going to start by asking a question and then I can answer the question uh, in front of me. How many of us know what Nigeria's INDCs are? Just raise your hand if you know First of all, if you know what an INDC is, INDC, what is it? Do you know? Okay, if you're not on the podium and you know what an INDC is. Okay, so we've got like three out of maybe 100 people in the room that know what an INDC is. Um, okay, so we take the I out and say NDC. Do we know? Oh, so some people know NDC but do not know the I. All right, that's good. We're making progress. 
Um, so let me at least, so if we are going to have a conversation about are we doing enough, we need to know what is it. Enough of what to fight climate change? Enough of what? I mean, does this conversation really make sense to you, to us? Sorry. Um, so in 2015, which is where I met Prof, uh, in the corridors of one of those uh, places in, in uh, Paris. Um, Nigeria went to Paris and made some commitments on behalf of all of you in this room. We went there, we negotiated with the rest of the world, and we agreed with them something that apparently you guys don't even know anything about. So let me tell you what it, it was that was committed on your behalf. We committed to reducing our uh, carbon emissions by 45%, conditionally. But without condition, by 20%. That's what we committed to. So no condition, we reduce emissions by 20%. But if certain conditions were met, including money, we could go as, as, as low as 45% of our emissions by 2030, which is how many years away from now? Nine years. Okay, well, they say we should not count 2020 because it's not one year. We didn't leave it. Um, and then end gas flaring by 2030. So we said that we were going to end all gas flaring by 2030. Then solar grid, off-grid generation in Nigeria for communities that we cannot reach by the grid. We are going to generate 13 gigawatts. That's about four, sorry, three to four times the amount that we already have on the grid now. In the next nine years, we're going to do this. 13 gigawatts of solar. We also went to Paris. I don't know what they were, maybe it was the croissant that they were giving us there, but we committed to 30% energy efficiency by 2030. Now, the reason why, if you notice there's a trend to all of this, we realize that the problem in Nigeria is that we consume energy, but we don't consume it productively. So it's inefficient. So we consume a lot of energy, but for our GDP, we consume more than what our GDP is. So we have the same consumption profile as, let's say, Spain. But Spain has a bigger GDP than us. I think it's three to four times what we produce. And so we realized that our goal was to be more efficient. So we produce more with less energy. So we decided, okay, well, we are going to commit to reducing or improving our energy efficiency by 30%. <coughs> this one, I don't know if you agree. We committed to improve the electricity grid. Have we made any progress? Huh? Somebody says somewhat. Have we improved? Uh, do you have more electricity at home? Okay, so it depends on where you live. Okay, all right, good. Then we also committed that we are going to move a lot more passengers outside of their cars into buses. So we are going to create, we are going to make it more attractive for people to park their cars at home and enter bus to go to work. We committed that. And Lagos is trying, you know, I, you know, I hear the Lagos person nodding. I'm going to give you credit. Even though I, you know, I criticize government a lot of time. But it's only Lagos. Abuja, we have retrogressed. We don't see those El Rufai brosses anymore. But elsewhere in the country, nobody really cares. Okay? Um, we also committed to climate smart agriculture. But we never told the farmers. <laughs> um, we committed to reforestation. I don't know if you know anything about that. Okay. Anyway, so... Um, this is not a question that anyone, you know, are we doing enough? It's not a question that anyone on this panel can answer for you. We all have to ha answer this because climate is a collective responsibility and it's going to be a collective outcome at the end of the day. We are all going to get the report card. It's not just going to be a few people. All of us are going to get whatever comes out of our performance when it comes to climate mitigation, when it comes to climate resilience, and when it comes to adaptation. So the question, are we doing enough? How many of us think we are? Just in the context of our commitment to other countries in Paris, 
Forget everything else. Are we doing enough? Anywhere near enough? Okay. So that's the reality. Now there is a proverb, a Yoruba proverb, that people, it's very popular. It says, you cannot shave a man's head in his absence. How many have heard it? What we did in Paris was we went and shaved Nigeria's head in advance. <laughs> and it was a very nice haircut. Now we are trying to catch Nigerians to now shave the head. But we are not able to do that. Now, and that's because there's a disconnect between how we talk about climate to people like Tancred, to people in this room, there's a disconnect between how we engage and how we engage about climate to the rest of Nigeria that consumes most of the energy. And we are not doing enough. 80% of the energy consumption in Nigeria is biomass, it's fuel wood. And it deals with something that people cannot do without, it's food. People want to cook, and they cook with firewood. And some of us are even guilty. Some of us prefer firewood jollof rice. Raise your hand. Tell the truth, please. Don't lie. Don't lie. Even the Lagos, madam. Eh? You are right. Eh? Some of us, if you are offered an option between firewood jollof rice, if, they, if you go to, go to a wedding, and they say firewood jollof rice, gas cook jollof rice, we know where we will go. Now, so there is a cultural aspect of doing enough that we are not actually talking about. It's great to talk about the technical aspect. It's great to talk about all the little nice innovative stuff. But for climate adaptation to become a culture, because this is really us. I mean, we talk about post-COVID, and we're saying that things will not go back to normal because something has fundamentally changed. That's the same impact that climate change is going to have. Now, it's going to change the way we do things, how we go to work, how we do work, how we f cook food, how we consume energy, how we entertain ourselves. All of that is going to change, how we even move around. Now, that cultural, thank you, that cultural change, that cultural shift, we need to start addressing it, because that's how we scale. If we are going to preserve the forest, it has to be a cultural thing. There has to be cultural incentive for us to do what we're doing. There has to be a cultural um, incentive to preserve the forest. Now, I think 2020 was a reminder that we're not doing enough. And I'll tell you why. You see, in the last 30 years, what scientists are telling us is the incidence of outbreaks of zoonotic diseases is increasing. You know what zoonotic diseases are? Right? Now, those are viruses that emanate from animals, right? And I know, I know that Rachel will like this. The more we encroach into the forest, the more we encounter wildlife that our immune system is not used to. Isn't, doesn't that sound like COVID? No immunity to the kind of viruses that these bats, bats are home to like maybe 4,000, 5,000 different viruses. Some of them coronaviruses. And we are entering into their homes, encroaching into their habitats eating them. And so we are welcoming new guests that we do not have the capacity to manage. And we don't know that our immune systems cannot respond. We do not have the antibodies to fight those, those viruses. So 2020 was a reminder that we are not doing enough. And it was also a reminder that Nature can respond. Because in 2020, we dropped emissions in some countries by 30%, globally by almost 
So nature was like, okay, ca calm down. I can shut you down. I can show you how to live life without all of these things you fancy. And we did. So if we are going to do enough, maybe 2020 should be our template. Look back and say, what have we learned from this little, you know, when we were in school, we didn't have light. So we had a generator. It was an old generator. And this is where I'm going to end. It's an old generator. And the light was on from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And then they switched it off. But at exactly 9.55, because we were students then, most of us didn't have a watch. At exactly 9.55, the light would blink just a little bit to remind us that it's in the next five minutes, everywhere will go dark. That, I believe, is what 2020 was for us. It's a little warning sign to say that there is an urgency attached to all the messages we are seeing here. That the education, the capacity building, the cultural change, all of the investment, the infrastructural investment, the creation of facilities for people to participate in an economy that is green, that is new, that is renewable. That investment needs to be made now. And if we don't, we wouldn't know what will come out of it. It will be just as unpredictable as 2020 was. Thank you. Like to say something? Yes. I, I didn't quite get the designation, madam. So we'll have a full introduction. I was just about to get really upset with government official. <laughs> My name is Dolapo Fashawe, the general manager of Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency. And we are that agency that deals with air, soil, and water pollution, all what we've been talking about here today. I was going to talk about e-waste and how attention is gradually being... There was a buzz uh, last year and how somehow the buzz is dying down. Somebody said, we know what we see and feel, not what we hear and read. We need to start for us to do enough, people have to start saying. Unfortunately, 2020 for La CEPA, an environmental protection agency, was one of the best um, years with my KPIs. KPI, basically air quality. For the first time since CNN started reporting air quality, Lagos had won one of the best in the world. And that's just because we were stuck indoors, simply. But must there be a pandemic for there to be blue skies? No. I'm a medical doctor, public health professional. And in addition to what the last speaker said, I will tell you, COVID is new. Reverse a little, SARS, Lassa, bird flu, mad cow disease, all of it with our interaction with animals, naturally and un 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 unnaturally. But do we stop eating beef? I hear, I have read of an organization fighting climate change by not eating beef in the UK because the process and the conservation, and even the butchering and cleaning process releases nitrous oxide and all. So they're just not eating beef. Are we doing enough? No. But are we trying to call attention? Yes. And back to Prof. My name is Dolako again. <laughs> what has changed is this is my cut. Yes, I have mine here. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm not going to miss that. <laughs> <laughs> and what has changed is this administration of Governor Babajide Songolu is very particular about secular economy and sustainability in all we do with policies, with even enforcement, at least my agency, we do quite a bit in enforcement. A lot of people know us with air pollution, but that was kind of deliberate because I needed to make our presence known. Now we're talking air pollution as in noise pollution. They were reporting churches and mosques and just to make our presence felt. Now, thanks to World Bank, we have six air quality monitoring machines in Lagos. Six of them. Real-time online data. And we're exchanging data with the American Embassy, who has won. Are we doing enough? No. But are we trying? Yes. Now, with these air quality machines, for me, as a public health physician, I advocate C, and I remember here, and it's not my business, with the NDCs, it's true. We have all heard and we move on. I advocate for Lagos State determined contributions, and I advocate for CSOs and NGOs to hold us responsible for it. I believe I'm well read and exposed, but urban sprawl and what she said about, um, yeah, it just never occurred to me as something that government can insist as a policy. There must not be abandoned building. The land must be used for something. And right from inception to implementation and the use of the land, we're thinking sustainability from the beginning. What has changed also is that if we look at Mr. Somolu's themes, T-H-E-M-E-S, like him, let me ask, how many people know themes? The pillar of the government. One. <laughs> Okay, everybody knows, at least Madam Consul General knows. That's okay for me, <laughs> the fact that she knows. When we look at health and environment, and the last one, sustainability and growth, it is obvious that it wants to pay attention to climate change. Both Paris Protocol, Kyoto Protocol, and the last one, Kigali, we're all signatories, but it was done behind our back. Even I, standing here, cannot reel out what we have signed to. And how do we solve this? Advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. People listen to government. People listen to government a lot, especially when you tie it with incentives or punishments. One of the two, they will listen. Are we doing enough? No. But are you guys all doing enough? No. Somebody was talking about air quality and data. If La Sepa doesn't know, and we have six machines out there, then we're all working in silos, and we won't get much done. We can move quicker if we come together. What has changed again is that a public health physician is now general manager of Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency. <laughs> and we would appreciate if when you talk about partnerships and stakeholders, La Sepa is mentioned. We are, she knows, enthusiastic and willing to, 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 we can't hit net zero, that's my own personal belief, but to work towards it and let everybody Apart from Lagos, they determine contribution. Individually determine contribution. IDC. Most important. <laughs> and we will hold people responsible for it. We will make policies for it. Waste management, waste disposal, how we treat our waste, recycling policies, age of cars that come into this country, burning of fossil fuels. I am happy to say La Sepa is the only agency in Lagos that has a hybrid bus. We have a hybrided bus because I want to see 
what we're talking about. And because of that, the success of that study, which we did over eight months, Lagos State Government is planning to hybrid all BRT buses. Are we doing enough? No, but are we doing something? Yes. And we want you to encourage and hold us responsible. Um, in closing, I just want to say, no, Rachel, not again. <laughs> in closing, I just want to say, electrical and electronic waste mining is something we are ignoring. We are <laughs> looking at the usual suspects. There are some unusual suspects. And as we move towards the digital age, what Corona has put us inside, there will be more demand for lithium, for copper, for aluminium, and the processes of smelting those things is not a joke. If COVID had happened before Kyoto Protocol, I'm sure they would have, you know, thought about it. Plastics. How do we deal with plastics? How do we deal with all these face masks and ventilators and all? Well, Lagos State has political will and our hands are opened to partnerships that are constructive and we show that we are doing something in the fight against climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to meet... Um, it's good to meet educated Nigerians. Uh, Pius and um, Amara, I'm sure you listened to her carefully. There are some things she said that are very important. I know why I'm picking on two of you. Um, I, won't, I won't say that government official again. That are um, Ten years ago, nine years ago, eight years ago, would typically meet in Lagos State for the Lagos Climate Summit. Some three years ago, as Vice Chancellor in a university, I hosted go former Governor Fashola. And um, he came to the university, I was Vice Chancellor, to inspect the solar plant ahead of the Vice President coming to commission it. We, the, that university somewhere is the first Nigerian university with a solar plant and that runs 24 hours on solar. Um, then I asked him a question. I said, why don't we get invited to Lagos again every January? It was quite an international gathering. People came from all over the world. And he looked at me and said, Vice Chancellor, you know, um, it's not the same every time, you know. But I'm very excited and happy to meet somebody like you. And you, I learned something from you that I take forward. I also headed the team that did Lagos strategy plan on climate change. That was in 2012, we submitted that. What was Canadian money, $5 million that we spent all over the country. I headed that team. Well, so I also headed the team that did national strategy on climate change. That's nearly 10 years ago. Somebody said here that Lagos, U.S., better than the others. Well, Lagos is not Nigeria. I'm here with dressing Nigeria. We came to Lagos to focus more on the private sector, but we, we are always forced to look at the public sector. And I just met one educated Nigerian. I wish I was younger. And Leila has said we're looking at fresh, fresh faces, not the faces people saw in the Lagos summit 10 years ago, like my own. But I've learned something from you. Something I've been trying to communicate, but maybe I didn't get the right words. The NDC is what our country committed to. And Amara so beautifully broke the thing down. But we didn't make that agreement on behalf of Nigeria, recognizing that Nigeria is a federal state. And we need to find a way to get those who we went to sign the agreement on behalf to even understand what we are signing. We, tr we tried several times to have national workshops, supposedly. But I know what I know, and I know that there's a major disconnect 
Earlier today, I had that interview with you guys. The country goes beyond what we do there. Because much of these things are in the concurrent list. In fact, a lot more of the things are the responsibilities of the states. But either somehow we've not been able to get the states to be part of what we commit, neither are they even aware of what we have committed them to. And today you called it the state that Lagos determined contribution. That's something we need to learn. We need to learn that and we need to take that message when we go back to Abuja in all those meetings and all those workshops and events. That there's a way, there has to be a way to break down the responsibility. But more importantly, a way to get the states to finally play some role outside Lagos, sometimes Delta, in the past, Cross River, not as much, not as much, in, from what I know, then once in a while, Undo, or we, we try to push Quara. And there are 36 states in this country. We're talking of waste, energy, and so on and so forth. We're talking of forests. And thank you for bringing in the mitigation aspect to this. And when I meet educated people, the things I remember to tell them, I don't usually say that to uneducated people. You know, I, there's a difference. Not those who have certificates. Those who can truly debate and don't get angry. Many years ago, and one, one of the young ladies here had talked about Nairobi, and I remembered one guy, Matai, Bongari Matai, that attempt to destroy that beautiful garden in the middle of Nairobi. And how she went on a hunger strike and protest before the Nobel, if you remember. I look at our cities. I look at even the one we built in our time. What, it, what did we truly make out of it? If you can reclaim swamp lands and reclaim some kind of areas and turn them into beautiful estates, you can also take them back and turn them into beautiful gardens and parks. I'm sure you can do that. Lagos is crying for such things. Modern to the first century city that you can build on some have first sadly done things of the past. I'm sure you can do that. If you can take back certain kind of places and modernize them into other states, you can also take them and turn them into something like the middle of Nairobi. That's my message. Thank you. So let's go. Let's go right back. Let's go. Let's be sure because uh, Leila has said we don't have more than 20 minutes left now. Let's be sure how many persons like to make a contribution and speak. And I like to take numbers. So you are one, you are two, you are three. So three persons. Don't change your mind. Four. Four. I go again. One. Okay. I see one more. One, two, three, four. All right? Okay. Number one. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Olumide Idowu. Uh, I'm the founder of International Climate Change Development Initiative. First of all, let me appreciate my boss. My, uh, let me call her my mom, Dr. Uh, Dolapo Fashaway, for her contribution. So I just want to clarify some uh, points that uh, Mr. Amara just mentioned. Please, I remember very well that uh, we are both in Paris together. And I want to raise this point that um, ending gas flaring was, the target was 2020, January, if we go back to the World Bank uh, report. And because of COVID-19, the federal government closed within the year 2020, they said they are ending in 2030. So we are hoping that in 2030 we are going to end gas flaring. So I just want to make that very clear. And uh, somebody also mentioned something about, uh, I think from Eco Capital. I can tell you that uh, what you are doing when it comes to climate finance, uh, I remember very well the UK government opened an application for somebody that would be in an intermediary between the government, uh, 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 Ministry of Finance, and Ministry of Environment. But up to today, we've not even know what is going on. Who is the person 
What is it doing? What consultation has it been doing with stakeholders? And for this kind of project supported by, I, I think you said, African Development Bank, we need to also look into that because what the person is supposed to be doing is to open access for funding for climate action in Nigeria. And I, I also want to mention about the NDC targets. You know, it started with the INDC, right from uh, uh, um, Paris, I, I think from Peru. Then when we got to Paris, we have the INDC, now it's NDC. I want to say it again that it's no more five, it's now seven. And I think we also need to go back and check the, the other two targets that have been added to it to know that there are a lot of things that is going on. So when do we submit our NDC? Is that a question? I remember we had the young people's contribution to the NDC. Private sector did their own and other sector did. So my point here is that if people want to, I want to ask Mr. Amara that on the NDC target towards the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, that's agriculture, what do you think, uh, I don't know the kind of sector I should put you, should be the role when it talks about uh, food security? And I think I asked this question to you some months back about the GMO, because we want to know the target in our end, how we are going to look at that GMO issue. Thank you very much. The second person, please. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's a great privilege. I never knew um, we have this kind of gathering in, in Lagos State, as more especially that we are discussing climate change and what we can do. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Oku, and I'm representing uh, Smart Gas. Uh, I'm here with uh, my colleague, okay, Miracle. And what I'm looking at is um, for the aspect of deforestation. But before I go on, I would like to um, let us be aware of, of mean, smart gas and what we represent. Actually, we are a base, technological based company and we are into retail and um, wholesale of uh, liquefied petroleum gas, which is the LPG. I wanted to address a uh, doctor that just spoke right now. In terms of deforestation, we have a lot of our rural areas. They need to cook and they need to sustain themselves. And most of them go into firewood, cutting down of trees, and looking at the aspect of making sure that they are actually well fed. The question then is to Ms. Rachel, what are we doing to help this particular set of people to actually sustain themselves? Because if we say we don't want forests to be cut, mean we are depriving some certain set of people their ends meal. So in general, these are the rural side of the country whereby we need to educate them and we need to make sure that they are aware of what actually they are getting into. Because we cannot simply tell them, you don't have to cut down trees. So the question is, how do they sustain themselves? Like for us from Smart Gas, what, we, what we're trying to do is collaborate with traditional rulers with their community in a way whereby we can actually introduce LPG to them. Instead of going into the forest, cutting down trees, and deforestating the forest, making sure that our animals are endangered, we introduce this aspect of liquefied gas to them so that they can actually understand that there's no need of going into the forest to cut down trees as to feed their family. So our Bring this so that you can look into it in meetings to all the panels here. Because we are, the topic say, what are we doing? Are we doing enough to fight climate change? And we have different aspects of it. So the one aspect I would like us to look into is how we can help the rural communities to help them actually shift away from the aspect of firewood cooking, which actually, in its own form, is risk to the climate itself which in some aspect brings bad health to the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Number three. Yeah, good afternoon all. My name is Idewe Suku. Actually, I lobby a lot to perform a song in this uh, forum, but I wasn't given the opportunity. I have to come and make this uh, contribution towards this gathering. When you talk of fight, I was even expecting someone of us 
to come with some instrument because when you want to fight, you have to come with some instrument. So fighting climate change is not just all about grammars because s since 2011, I've been in different fora on climate change. It's been the same thing, the same people, the same grammar, and the same approach. But I want to ask us, how many people in the streets, how many youth know about climate change? Did they are they are they conscious about the environment? No. After this gathering, we we'll go back to our various home. Did we preach the environment to the people? No. If you look at it, the scientific uh, terminology of explaining climate change is different. But people like us are bring it down, and uh, we do music, we do song that we that we cut across people in different length that made them understand there are a lot of creativity in this climate change that we can use to reach people there are some people you talk you will tell them about climate change or environment they are like what are you saying even the university student graduate they, they knew nothing how do we pass this message to them so they are there are a lot of devices, there are a lot of ways, a lot of means we can use to pass this message across to them. You see, Mr. Oko said that uh, they have uh, the youth forum. We will tell you today, Nigerian youth today are more interested in uh, sport and uh, entertainment. Why can't you divide a means? Get across to them in that area. Today, we need to change different approach if we want to fight climate change. There are a lot of grammar. Sometimes I get tired of gra this grammar. The same people in different, different, the same conference, the same gathering. Nothing has changed. I want to advise us. <laughs> we, are, we have a lot of players that can do a lot in this climate change. Because if we say we'll be discussing this, this, this issue, we keep discussing to t uh, 2050, nothing will happen. So I want us to change. Thank you. Thank you. Then the lady in front, did you raise your hand? Okay, then one more person then. Be patient, she let her talk. Hello everybody, my name is Marvella Odili and I'm the founder of Save Our Needy. Um, we've been talking about the fight against climate change, and I did not hear anything about taking this fight to schools. Um, in my own opinion, I would say it's a suggestion. It's not that I'm actually asking a question. I'm suggesting that we take this fight to schools, secondary schools, primary schools, like we say, catch them young. And also, let us develop other strategies. Because like the last speaker said, he was talking about just... Uh, speaking grammar to put it in his words i feel like he's trying to say we can use other means like using the arts using comedy using music using drama to pass our message across to more people and i believe that this will touch more people than just speaking uh, big english i believe that has a uh, more impact that we have more impact on getting more people involved in this fight against climate change thank you very much the lady in front here. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, and uh, thank you to all the speakers. Um, one of the things I just wanted to ask is, um, in terms of, I think somebody mentioned individually determined contributions, and I think there's a lot of importance in terms of every Nigerian taking responsibility in terms of what they're doing in the fight against climate change. But currently at the moment where most households require a generator, which obviously has a lot of emissions, and when there's also pressing urgent issues like rising unemployment, poverty, insecurity, um, regardless of using the arts and all the different various means that are used, what incentives can we really present to the average Nigerian that climate change is something that should be at the forefront of their minds when they're dealing with so many, you know, a myriad and plethora of other issues that seem pressing, you know, within 
a number of days, minutes to days, as opposed to climate change, which seems like a slow ticking time bomb. Of course, everybody here recognizes and understands the importance of it, but the average Nigerian who has so many things to think about on a day-to-day -day basis, what kind of holistic approach are we taking to, sh to show that climate change is something that is, needs to be made important right now? Thank you. Thank you very much. Many interventions on awareness raising and the right way to proceed. I think we need to stop now as far as the questions are concerned. So, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, please pick up the question you wish to answer. Um, and, or, or come, yeah, there, there was one first there. And then I will ask you, uh, I will ask you in addition to the answer to the question, to try to provide us with the kind of recommendation you would make to one of the big men of this world uh, if you could have 30 seconds to talk with him or her. It's not easy, but try to scratch your head. Next 30 seconds, you have, you have the opportunity to meet Mr. or Mrs. X. It can be macro in my case. You have 30 seconds maximum. It can be 15 seconds. What would be your recall? It will be my ask. Uh, I stole the microphone, sorry. <laughs> 30 seconds. The lady behind me, we have an extracurricular group we have formed in primary and secondary schools called environmental bees. But we need more hands, we need more educated people, we need more NGOs and CSOs like you to either be funded or offer free extra co curricular um, um, information advocacy, activities in a fun way. Talk to me afterwards. The group is there. We're in 27 schools, public schools in Lagos. But I find it hard to keep them engaged and do my daily work. Thank you. 30 seconds. All right, th 30 seconds. Olumide asked me about GMO. Uh, and uh, from his listening, he's already, he says he's asked me this question before, and probably I didn't ask, answer him satisfactorily. Uh, well, climate change, uh, we are also looking at the environment, so we're trying to protect it as well. So I'm not an expert in impact of you know, GMO on the environment, but it seems that there's a focus on yield and you know, how much uh, crop is coming out of the ground, uh, more than what is actually happening to the environment, how we grow that food. Uh, I'm going to answer the question in Nimo Bassi's voice. Nimo Bassi is uh, the founder of Health of Mother Earth uh, Foundation and well-known uh, environmental activist in Nigeria. He says, for us to protect our ecosystem, to tackle global warming, and to keep our food diversity, we need to support agriculture that works in harmony with nature. Now, so my recommendation, and I'll focus this on climate readiness for agriculture. Important person, please listen. Improve stakeholder engagement. Remember, you cannot shave someone's head in their absence. Make sure they are involved. Two, establish knowledge and information services. Lagos State needs it. And I would offer you our, our two documentaries so that your kids can watch. Uh, two, develop the framework to implement uh, the climate smart agricultural strategy that Nigeria already has. Three, build capacity at the community level. Not just at national level, at the community where the problems are being encountered, just like uh, Rachel is doing, build it. Uh, and finally, provide information and accounting systems. How do people, you can't improve what you do not measure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'll follow up in addition to you. Um, amidst COVID-19, uh, smart agriculture actually is the oxygen for Africa and Nigeria uh, to recover from both social, economic, and environmental development. And so that's one of the right way for us to tackle climate change. Uh, finance drive and investment uh, mobilization finance sources for youth and women running with a lot of amazing ideas to shape the implementation of the Paris Agreement and also 
to tackle climate change. And we need to also establish mutual reinforcing MRV system, that's monitoring, verification, and reporting system to track our progress in terms of policies, in terms of how far we've also gone in the commitments that we've had. And also we need to cost of sectoral action plans and transit also with what Madam have said, also transit our NDC to the states and the local communities. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna say something briefly to what um, Olumide asked. So he was talking about um, there was an opening for from the UK government in access to um, climate finance. I think that was your question. So first of all, the project that I was talking about as the AFDB project is to build the capacity of the SMEs, make them ready to assess climate finance. That is one on the aspect of the project. Now for the opening, which you said that is a good opportunity to see how climate finance could flow into the you know, the country. Well, um, I, I know that some of my colleagues and then some people I know put in for that position, but um, they were in response actually. And another thing I noticed is um, the numbers of experience. Yes, the years of experience that was required. Um, maybe that is one of those things that didn't make it really, really go well. So maybe when such openings and opportunity comes out, they should consider that if they were young people, the years of experience needs to really, really come down, you know, to make real people that are so passionate about this to go in, into the position. So for recommendation, they've mentioned very beautiful point. So I'm going to also bid on that. MRV is very, very important. You know, if you don't measure something, how do you know the quantity that you are able to control? So MRV system is so needed for projects and also awareness creation of such projects who are important. You know, making the public know that this is what you are doing. And then I'm going to use Lafarge as a case study. Lafarge has been doing a lot, a lot, a lot. Like they have this um, Geosaku um, operations that they are currently working on. And I know how well they really publicize it, you know, make the public know about it. So creating awareness of those green projects also make the public know that this is also going on. Then for the art, yes, um, I'm aware that climate change was being, I'm going to use the word preach, was being spoken about in the in the in arts work. So I, I can't remember now what year, but in Calabar Carnival, if you remember the the popular Calabar Carnival, yes, I don't remember what year now. The focus was on climate change. It was so amazing the arts work. I mean the way people dance, showing that stop cutting down the trees. So a lot has been going on in that aspect also. Maybe not too much. Maybe we are not doing enough, like um, my Ch madam here says. We are not doing enough. That was in so, 2014. 2014. Thank you very much, sir. So we just have to put in more. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm just going to answer a few questions before I make my own. 30 seconds. <laughs> yes, 30 seconds. Uh, uh, I'll try. Nigerians have to learn to be disciplined. <laughs> yes, we have to. Um, so so two questions that came um, at me, the same question. Are we um, providing alternatives for communities? It, while it's a very good question, it's the same question we throw back to the community. If they cut down the trees, kill all the elephants, these are natural, the forest and the animals, they are not finite or the infinite resources. They, if, they, if they finish the forest, I use that word finish because that's the language we come down to when we are speaking with them, then what's left? Where do they fall back to? So our conservation work is not preventing them from their livelihoods, but actually preserving that same livelihood they depend on. So that's the picture. And I will have you know, the fellow that asked me about community livelihood, our project in the Niger Delta, the conservation, the protected area there is being driven by the community there. So it's a community conservation area. That's the extent to which the community themselves are bought into the importance of conservation. And um, that's for the question, but be, um, in view, in view, in view, in view sense, um, we are, or in essence, we are, um, with the help of our partners, the French Embassy in Nigeria, and then some other organisations in the UK, um, they are helping us to also provide 
alternative livelihood options for these communities. Um, we are training them on other livelihood options besides going into the forest, cutting down trees and hunting. So for more details on the specific of that, um, probably we could chat about that during the cocktail and all. So in conclusion anyway, I would just like to say that three things I think are very, very important. Um, if you ask me, are we doing enough to fight climate change? My answer would be that um, if we look at what we have lost and the opportunities that have gone by, it is really, it sounds very hopeless. It sounds like we've not done anything. But if we look, like, look at what's before us and what we are doing right now, I think like um, Mrs. Dolakpo said, Dr. Dolakpo, sorry, said, we, have, we are trying and we are getting there. I just want to say also that those people who have mentioned the issue of advocacy, can I just advise you that you have been coming to meetings like this since 2011. Like me, become ambassadors. You have your own constituency, I have mine. In our own local communities, we are teaching young children. We are giving them storybooks. We are making 3D animation videos for them. They are singing, composing songs in their local language for animals. They are doing drama series. In all these local communities from secondary school, primary school, and at any level, even the politicians, the, the government um, office holders, we are educating them at that level. And that's why we are getting the results we are getting today. It didn't come easy, but it came to consistent, persistent, and intensive conservation education out which within our constituency we don't have the platform at the national national level and you're not not every one of us is going to have that platform but whatever platform you have how much are you doing you can't sit here and accuse that people are sitting in gatherings like this and doing nothing you yourself make a decision i was frustrated to the to the point that i had to take a step do you understand me so you have to be that ambassador preach to your own um, constituents, the people around you from your family to the people in your church or in the mosque, whichever um, faith you are in, talk to them about it and gradually they will be converted over, they would have this knowledge and they will start living it. Besides, you don't even need to go far. COVID-19, are you happy with how, we have, how our life has been since last year? No smart self, that one alone. If it's that alone, you tell them, this is what has cost it. We encroached into nature. This is what has brought us here. Stop eating bush meat. This is what has brought us, because even in the urban areas where they do, they, that is far from the forest, they're eating bush meat. In fact, that's where the demands are higher. The people in the low, rural communities are sending them there. They're not even eating them themselves because it's too expensive. They fetch more money from taking them to the, to the urban areas. So that's where you start from. That's where you see the changes, and then you're happy with the results you're getting within your own constituency. Thank you. Thank you, Architect Tosi. I know it will be 30 seconds. <laughs> it will be short. I think um, based on the question that was raised, who, what would you like to raise or if you spoke to an important person? And I think in my case it would be anybody or any governor at a state level. I can only speak from in the capacity as an architect and looking at an urban environment. And from everything that's been said, we, we really need to protect our green belt areas. We need to create a ring, a solid ring of no further urban expansion. And to then use the tools available to us to further study our cities and improve living conditions and efficiency of cities in general. We are in the fourth industrial revolution now. We're in the information age. There is so much that can be solved with data. There are studies that have been done in New York where by studying the, 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 the actual process of, of, of taxi rides, they're able to realize that they were running a very inefficient system. And they were able to change the system of taxi services in the city to ensure they could reduce the number of taxis, but still keep the efficiency of actually getting people to travel around. And I think in our state, particularly particularly for Lagos, which is a very heavily dense urban area. We have probably solutions hiding in plain sight. When we have the information, if we have the data, then, then, then real solutions can then be professed from that. But I think ultimately, number one, we need to ring fence our, our protected areas. 
We need to improve our city capacities and use the, the technology available to us today with the, with the fourth industrial revolution to ensure that we create more efficient cities so that, yes, we can continue and hopefully better answer the question of addressing climate change. Thank you. Mohammed Buhari. Okay. Um, I think I'll go straight to the... To the That's actually his name, you know. Well, His name is Mohamed Buhari. But I'm not the president, so don't worry. <laughs> so what I will say to the, I think everyone is most important. So I assume that we are all most important persons. So what I will say briefly is, quickly is that we need to have modern villages. That is the solution to all of this. And now what I mean by a modern village is two things, simply. We need to produce food and the energy we require sustainably. So using the existing renewable energy technologies, how can we produce, put food on the table in a modern village or in a typical village? And how can we ensure that the energy they require for their home activities is all generated, produced sustainably? So that is the solution to all of this. So if we can do this at the, at the, at the family level, then I'm sure we'll get, to, we'll get over this question. So all our food production should be sustainably should be made using the existing renewable energy technologies, or better. And then all the energy we use in our home systems should also be generated, produced sustainably, using sus renewable energy technologies. And that is it. So that is what I will tell the most important person if I'm able to meet him. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's very, very interesting time. And um, just to add one little thing. Uh, th thank you very much, Dr. Fashaway, for coming. Your coming will help me answer a question the three young ladies asked me just before lunch. And they're laughing. They asked the, the question 2023, and I gave an answer that uh, they were going to be very angry with. They were sure that I had said the wrong thing. Then eventually I went around explaining to them, nobody will give it to you you will have to stand up and take it. Did you see the way she stood up and took it? She didn't wait for anybody to give it to her. And I went on to say, we will not give it to you. And I went on to remind you people who took it when they were 26 and when they were 30. This event today is about fresh faces. Not those faces people have seen a long time around places like this. You have to take it. You have to define and design and build a society that my generation, who came to consciousness in the oil boom era, did not quite understand and didn't quite live. Bear that in mind. Nobody will give it to you. The power of personal example. Not many persons remember that many years ago in this country, people volunteered to plant trees. We didn't wait for government to do that. Today we wait for government to plant trees. We went for the French embassy to give us money to plant trees. That's not who we are. Somebody has an idea that he can sing very nice songs about climate change. And he has been in several meetings over the years. The same people are saying the same things. And he's waiting for us to tell him to sing that song. That is, the, that is your calamity. Those of you are waiting for us to give it to you. Have I answered that question? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We could continue, but we have to stop. Um, we have answers. We have, we've had answers to these questions and to the next question, which, which is, are we about to do enough in the fight against climate change? I would rather lean toward the yes for the second question. Um, in France, whatever, whether we do enough or we don't do enough, we like to celebrate. Uh, so. There will be a cocktail where we can think further about the answer to this question. We had plenty of excellent answers. We had a very lively, meaty uh, exchanges. Uh, we need to continue. Uh, there are recommendations. We can, we can be further tweaked.
but we'll, I, I've noted them and they will pass on uh, to the next uh, summit and, 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 and fora where we'll be, where we'll be involved. Um, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much for your good heart, good will and involvement in this debate. Of course, it will continue. Actually, it was not a debate. It was a much more an exchange. I, I've, I've more richer than I was um, at the very beginning of this, uh, of this session. So thank you very much. I've learned a lot. Thanks to you. And uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, moderator, thank you very as much, well. Steve. And uh, to all this, all the people who made this even possible, a warm thank you. Uh, and let's move to the cocktail.